morning, you guys. We stand as we worship the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for what you did at the cross. Give us a heart to praise you this morning, Lord. You're so good. You're worthy. Praise you. All who are thirsty, all who are Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the ways of His mercy, as He could have to be. Come, Lord Jesus, come.
You're so good to us, Lord, enabling us to come and worship, to praise you, Lord, experience your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name.
fill us this morning, Lord. We can feel you here. Glorify you. We wait. 
to us. That's the least we can do, Lord. Seek your will. Be obedient unto you, Lord. Help us, Lord, with our unbelief. With the study of your word, we praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hello and good morning, Brick Creek. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Not yet. Almost. <laughs> Point it up toward you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. No, it's just that. Thing. Stage one here. We can mic you. Would you like a mic? Uh, Benny, you don't need no speaking. <laughs> I wasn't talking about the mic. I was just talking about whether or not you were ready for the Word of God. Amen. Some of us. Our message this morning comes from the second book of Kings. Halfway through chapter 6 and the entire chapter 7. It begins in chapter 6. Uh, now, this is going to be a long reading, and I ask you to bear with me, but we need to read this because it helps to put things in perspective. It helps us to get a clearer picture of uh, what's going on here. So please, bear with me. We're going to be doing a lot of scripture reading, so again, bear with me. But, uh, and there's also a reason for reading this entire half chapter of chapter 6 and the entire chapter 7, and uh, we'll find out at the end. Mm -hmm. That's why they call it bear creek, because you're going to bear with me. You know, the thing I love about the God that we serve is that he is not a respecter of persons. <clears throat> Whether you're a prince or a pauper, royalty or peasant, famous or obscure, rich or poor. Whether you're a king or a leper, God chooses whomever he wishes for fulfilling his promises and carrying out his purpose. As we often see at times, when leaders fail us, God will use the pauper, the peasant, the obscure, the poor, and yes, even the outcast of society, like lepers, to fulfill his purpose. Our reading begins in the sixth chapter of 2 Kings, starting at verse 24. Again, please bear with me. Now it came about after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, this is modern-day Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. There was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver, and a fourth of a cob of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cr cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. He said, If the Lord does not help you, from where shall I, shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king said to her, What is the matter with you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him. But she had hidden her son. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath his body. Then he said, May God do so to me, and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man from his presence, but the messenger but before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door shut against him. 
Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? While he was still talking with them, behold, the messenger came down to him, and, and he said, Behold, this evil is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a measure of fine flour will be sold for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. The royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Then he said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. The setting of our story is in the northern kingdom of Israel. The capital is Samaria. The king of Samaria is Joram, son of Ahab. The date is about 850 BC, 850 to 840 BC. As the story begins, Israel is under siege by the Syrian army. Today, this region is known as Syria. So, with th so this was a Syrian army laying siege to the northern kingdom of Israel, actually around Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom. Most of us understand what a siege is. It is a military tactic used to keep people confined within an area, but also to keep out things from going in, such as weapons, supplies, food, water, the necessities of life. The idea behind the siege is hoping that people will surrender peacefully from the inside. The famine here is so bad that the Israelites resort to cannibalism. As the king hears the story of cannibalism among his people, it fuels his anger. But he's angry for the wrong reason toward the wrong person. It wasn't Elijah he should be angry with and blaming. He shows no accountability for the disaster he has brought upon his people. But what he does, but what does he, but what does he care? He was not a king who trusted in God. Joram was the son of Ahab. You remember Ahab? the evil ruler who coveted the vineyard of Naboth to the point where his wife, you know his wife, Jezebel, plotted to have the vineyard taken from Naboth. And so she devised a plot where they would falsely accuse this man of cursing God and cursing the king. And it came to pass that he was stoned to death and... Uh, uh, Ahab took over the vineyard. Joram didn't fall too far from the tree. Time after time, God displayed his power by rescuing this king. From war, in preventing enemy raids on Israel, in breaking the Syrian siege on Samaria, as we will see, in many great miracles through the prophet Elisha. And despite all this, Joram never fully trusted God. In fact, the siege and famine, the Bible tells us, was a direct result of his not trusting in God. I want to talk about three things here. Leadership, the leaders, the lepers, and the good news. Leadership. True leaders are forged in the furnace of humility. Moses spent 40 years of his life in humility training in the deserts of, of uh, Media, in the Median Desert. As a result, God was able to use him to deliver his people, counted in the millions, on a 40-year journey into their promised land. Joseph, forged in the furnace of humility. God allowed it so that he would be sold into slavery become a butler and a housemaid, be charged with rape and thrown into prison. 
all this, uh, all this humility training to enable him to rise to second in command in Egypt in order to save his family so that the seed of Abraham, the line of David, may be saved. David also forged in the fire of humility. Spent 13 years or so as a fugitive, on the run, and in hiding from Saul and his forces. All those years of being on the run as a fugitive allowed David to experience humility for the task that God had waiting for him. Paul also forged in the furnace of humility. A Pharisee among Pharisees, most feared by the early Christians, blinded, stoned, whipped numerous times, bringing him close to death, journeyed on foot close to 10,000 miles on foot. Shipwrecked, bitten by snakes, imprisoned. All this to teach him humility. Leaders don't blame, blame others for their problems and failures. Joseph could have imprisoned or have all his brothers killed when they came to him because they were responsible for selling him into slavery. Joseph didn't blame them. He wasn't looking back at the past. He was considering the future. He knew that God had plans for him to lead. Leaders don't blame mothers for problems and failures. Judah, this is Joseph's brother. His brother ultimately takes responsibility for selling Joseph into slavery. You know, I can't help but wonder if his actions demonstrated here of accountability and responsibility led to his receiving the scepter promise in Genesis 49, 8-12. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is the lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. This is the result of not blaming others, being accountable. David, when he takes on another man's wife and then has him killed to hide his sin, he's confronted by the prophet Nathan. We read this in 2 Samuel 12. God was heavy-handed with his dealing uh, with David. The sword, will, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me. I will raise up adversity against you for your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wife in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Leaders lead because they have a heart for leading. They have a heart for people. The greatest example is Jesus. And then we can look at any of the disciples. And what about Mother Teresa? Jim Elliot, missionaries past and present, our military, police and those in law enforcement, firefighters, public and Sunday school teachers. Church ministry leaders, servants of God, all lead because they have a heart for others. I know you're sitting there saying, well, you know, I'm not a leader. Are you a mother or a father? Are you a parent? Do you have a son or a daughter? Well, then you're a leader. Your job is to lead them. Your job is to lead your family, to lead your sons and daughters, even your grandchildren, to Jesus. Oh, Denny, but I'm just a student. I'm, I'm single. I don't have any children. You have been commissioned as a believer to lead others to Christ. Your school peers as well to Jesus. How? Well, 
you know, Denny, I don't understand the Bible, you know, all that well. Students, you lead others to Christ through your actions, through your conduct, through your speech. By hanging out with people and not hanging out with people. Where you go and where you don't go, what you do and what you don't do. What you say and what you don't say. As chapter 7 begins, we see the king and his right-hand man paying a visit to the prophet Elijah. They are unaware that Elijah is already aware of their arrival and intent, but as they walk in, they are blindsided by good news. The king doesn't know what to make of it and is quiet, but his advisor, however, mocks the words of the prophet. You know, we can know a person by what comes out of his mouth. Our president has a press secretary. Before holding a press conference, with, uh, holding a press conference, she is briefed and updated on the latest regarding the president and his administration. So when she speaks, she acts as an extension of the president. Likewise with the vice president, when he speaks, he's speaking on behalf of the president. He is an extension of the president. When Elijah speaks to the king and to his top advisor, it's his advisor, the king's mouthpiece, that responds on behalf of the king. Listen to his response. The royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Another way of putting this is, you know what, Elisha? Even if the Lord opened the windows in heaven, no way that's going to happen. Like I said, we can know a person by what comes out of his mouth. The author is clear here. It's not Elisha's word that were uttered. It was the Lord. Listen to the word of God. Thus says the Lord. Like his stop advice, uh, Elisha was speaking on behalf of God. You know, in this world that we live in, it's not surprising at all that we have people in positions of leadership that mock God and his people. It appears to be the norm with a particular political group. It has become part of their worldview, part of their ideology. If it's not mocking God, then it's doing away with anything having to do with God, or even doing away with God altogether, banning the mention of his name. Some of you might remember a certain political party, national convention for the 2012 presidential election, where they put to a vote the removal of using God's name in their platform. You remember that? I'm not making this up. You know, it didn't pass. But you could hear a loud boo coming from the audience when it didn't pass. And you know what? These, delegate, these delegates, they're supposed to be leaders. They're elected leaders. We see here, like the king's top advisor who mocks God, belittles God, by implying that God is a liar and that he's unable to bring an end to this famine within 24 hours. Wow. Listen to what God says to such people. Now, I have several scriptures here because, you know, this is important. You know, I hate it when I watch the news and I see people mock Christians. I see people mock God. I see people mock, you know, some people call it religion. But it just upsets me. And so I have several scriptures here, so bear with me. Psalms 14, 1 and 2. Only fools says in their heart there is no God. They're corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. The Lord looks down from heaven and the, and the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. Psalm 7. Or 74, they thought we will completely crush them. They burned every place where God was worshipped in the land. We did not, or we do not see any signs. There are no more prophets, and no one knows how long this will last. God, how much longer will the enemy make fun of you? 
Will they insult you forever? Why do you hold back your power? Bring your power out of the open and destroy them. God, you have been our king for a long time. You bring salvation to the earth. Second Chronicles 32. The king also wrote letters ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him. Just as the gods of the prophets of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. Then they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to terrify them and make them afraid in order to capture the city. They spoke about the God of Jerusalem as they did about the gods of other peoples of the world. The work of human hands. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and commanders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with a sword. Second Peter 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's words, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Jude, dear friends, remember what the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ said before. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who laugh about God, following their own evil desires which are against God. These are the people who divide you, people whose thoughts are only of this world, who do not have the spirit. But dear friends, use your most holy faith to build yourself up. Praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, people today, leaders or not, will surely, as these scriptures warn us, be met with a similar fate. We cannot be leaders, whether at work, in communities, in government, and yes, especially in the church, and leave without having God as part of the leadership circle. Psalms 1. Blesses the man is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit and sees it and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in assembly of righteousness, of righteous. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous. This tells us the type of man Joram was, King Joram. We only have to look at who he surrounded himself with and what came out of their mouth. The lepers. The Hebrew word for leprosy is Tazeret, which translates to trouble. Lepers were treated as outcasts of society. They were feared, they were hated, because people at the time thought leprosy to be contagious. Others thought that it was a curse from God. And because of this, they were mistrusted and often not believed. Verse 3, now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say, we'll enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we will die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come, let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we will live, and if they kill us, we will but die. 
You know, first we read about royalty and leaders. And then God throws in the lepers. Interesting. We read that there are four lepers sitting outside the city gates. And they're outside the city gates because they are prohibited from residing, according to their law, within, within the city gates. They're discussing their situation. It's a matter of life and death. Their lives are hanging in the balance that come to that place that some call the end of their rope or the crossroads or the end of the road. They had a decision to make. Their first option, if they remained where they were and did nothing, they would die. Not a good option. If they entered the city, famine was in the city. They would die. Not a good option. Option three, surrendering to the Syrian army. And maybe, just maybe, just the tiniest sliver of hope that the Syrians would spare their lives, take them as prisoners, and give them food. What a contrast in people's outlook. In times of adversity, the king and his advisor have murder on their minds. While their citizens are planning a way for their survival. As leaders, shouldn't they be planning a way out or looking at ways to resolve the crisis? Killing people should be the last thing on their minds. The lepers set their minds on option three. You know, when you come to your wit's end, that's the very place that God wants to meet you. These four lepers threw caution to the wind. They took the only logical course of action left to them. They will wait until dark and then make their way to the Syrian camp. But when they arrive at the Syrian camp, they are shocked at what they find. The camp is empty. It is deserted. There is no one to be found, but everything to be found. We are told by the author of what happened. Do you realize that the Syrian forces were defeated without Israel lifting a finger? It is almost unbelievable that another attacking army would come in the middle of the night and destroy a Syrian army. The city would surely have heard the footstep of the marching, marching soldiers, the wheels of the chariots, the hooves of the horses, but there was nothing to be heard. Surely there would have been carnage, soldiers killed doing battle, but there was none. So what happened? When they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us kings of the Hittites and kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Therefore they arose and fled in twilight and left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp as it was and fled for their lives. This was a perceived army, perceived only by the Syrians and no one else. When these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent, ate and drank, and carried from their silver and gold and clothes, and went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent, and carried from there also, and went and hid them. Can you imagine the excitement and the thrill of these lepers that they're fined. They ate, they drank, they probably put on a new change of clothes and probably rolled in the silver and gold that they found. And as they're enjoying this, enjoying their good fortune, they come to a realization that they couldn't keep this to themselves. It wasn't right for them to be celebrating while their own people were suffering. So they decided Take the good news to their people. Then they said to one another, we're not doing right. This day is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore, come. Let us go and tell the king's household. So that they came, so they came and called to the gatekeeper of the city. And they told it, uh, them, saying, we came to the camp of the Arameans, and behold, there was no one there. Nor the voice of men, only the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents, just as they were. 
the gatekeeper called and told it within the king's household. You know, this happened in the twilight hour as it was going dark. And so by the time the word gets back to the city, it's dark. It is the midnight hour. And although it's midnight, the lepers are thinking to take this good news to the people. You know this God that we serve? He is the God of the midnight hour. Esther 6. The Jews were about to be destroyed under edict. But that night, the king could not sleep. Something was keeping him up. And so he requests the book of records to read through. Lo and behold, what he comes across is the critical information needed that to change the fate of the Jewish people. Esther and her people will be spared. They will not be killed. Rather, they will be celebrated. The Spirit of God was working. It was working even in the midnight hour. Acts 16, Paul and Silas, in prison and chains in Thyatira, modern-day Turkey. They were beaten with rods, thrown in jail, ordered by the chief magistrate to be guarded securely. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns and praises to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison house was shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. God of the midnight hour. Exodus 12, 29. Now, it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land. Midnight. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. God is the God of the midnight hour. When you're asleep, he's working on your behalf. When all hope is gone and you have arrived at the end of your road, he is standing there. At the end of your road, even if it's the midnight hour, asking you why it took you so long to come to him. John 5, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Our God works around the clock, even during the midnight hour. The good news. Good news, life-saving news, delivered courtesy of the lepers. It's looked down upon, met with skepticism and unbelief. You know, not different at all, spiritually speaking, from our world today. Oh, that people would embrace the good news. Then the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will now tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we will capture them alive and get into the city. One of his servants said, please, let some men take five of the horses which remain, which are left in the city. Behold, there will be in any case like all the multitude of Israels who are left in it. Behold, they will be, in any case, like all the multitude of Israel who have already perished, so let us send and see. They took, therefore, two chariots with horses, and the king sent after the army of the Arameans, saying, Go and see. You know, verse 13 here reminds us of the severity of the famine. In the entire city of Samaria, there are only five horses left. Why? Well, you can guess. But most likely, because they've eaten them. Of interest also is an unnamed official here who speaks out to the king. You see, the king had made up his mind already that they weren't going. Nobody was to be sent out. But this unnamed official speaks out. 
But it is through his advice, his suggestion to the king, that things take a turn. Don't you just love how God takes ordinary people and use them to fulfill his purpose? They went after them to the Jordan. And behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment, which the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. Then the messengers returned and told the king. So the prophet went out and plucked, so the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. Then a measure of flour was sold for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king appointed now the king appointed royal officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. But the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died, just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel, will be sold tomorrow about this time in the gates of Samaria. Then the royal officer answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, Behold, you will see with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. Because you will be trampled at the gates. Just as God had spoken his promise to Elisha, a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel. Now, you know, I tried to look up what a measure amounted to. And people had different thoughts on this. So I'm not going to say because they were just really, really far apart. But I can tell you that a shekel in today's standard is about 35 cents. Now, I had said in the beginning that it was necessary to read our story from the beginning. You see, our story is also the story of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Spiritually speaking, the world is under siege by the enemy, thereby causing a spiritual famine in the world. The world under siege is in need of spiritual food. It needs manna. It needs the bread of life. They are parched and in need of a drink, the living water. The siege needs to be broken. And that should weigh heavy on the minds of our leaders, spiritual and otherwise. But many of them, rather than planning a breakthrough of the siege and looking after the lives of the people they serve, they have their own agendas. And as a result, they too become part of this siege. We as believers are the lepers. We have become the outcasts of society. We are committed to God. We are commanded to love one another. And we are commissioned to go out and take the good news. Though we are lepers, we have found the bread of life. We have found the living water. We have found the manna. We have found the royal robes and the royal garments. We have found the silver and gold in the good news, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we come to know, and as we come to fall in love with Jesus, we come to understand that we cannot keep him to ourselves. That this good news must be shared with the world that is under siege. A world that is hungry for salvation and starving for deliverance. We are the lepers. And because there are those in the world that look to us as diseased, our word becomes hard to believe. Sharing the good news can be difficult. Yes, difficult. And people may not believe us, but that is our commission. That is what we need to do. That is what we as believers, we as lepers, have been called to do. Conclusion. The God we serve is not a respecter of persons. 
whether you're prince or whether you're pauper, royalty or peasant, famous or obscure, rich or poor, whether you're a king, whether you're a leper, God chooses who chooses whomever he wishes for the fulfilling of his promises and carrying out his purpose. And as we often see, when leaders fail us, God will use the pauper. He will use the peasant. He will use the obscure. He will use the poor. And yes, even the outcasts of society, like the lepers, to fulfill his purpose. And these are troubled times. We're desperately in need of godly leaders forged in the furnaces of humility. We can also know a person by what comes out of their mouth. We need to understand and take to heart that God cannot be ridiculed. God cannot be mocked. God uses ordinary people. People like you and I. Aren't you glad you're a leper? Even the outcasts of society he uses to fulfill his promises and to carry out his will. Our God is a God of the midnight hour. And lastly, whatever God's promises, as he has promised in the past, will come to pass. Therefore, all that he promises for you and I in the future will come to pass as well. Thank you, and may God bless you. Amazing love. 
Enjoy your week, you guys. Enjoy. Enjoy.